Okay, we're going to uh, continue the program now by uh, talking about the use of animals in TV and film. And we're very pleased to have a nationally recognized panel of speakers to address that topic. Uh, first, I'd like to introduce Karen Rosa, who is the National Director of the Film and TV Unit for the American Humane Association. And she has been with the American Humane Association for 20 years and leads the Los Angeles-based Film and TV Unit. That program monitors animal action on over 2,000 productions a year and grants film productions that follow its guidelines and requirements, the famed No Animals Were Harmed and Credit Certification. Ms. Rosa is a graduate cum laude of the Moore College of Art and has completed graduate work in advanced design at Hunter College in New York. Uh, Kathy Guillermo is a senior vice president of laboratory investigations for people for the ethical treatment of animals. She works with whistleblowers and federal and state agencies to crack down on experimenters who violate animal welfare laws and regulations. In 2010 and 2011, she exposed the cruelties of thoroughbred slaughter, releasing the first ever footage of the horse slaughterhouse in Japan, where the 1986 Kentucky Derby winner Ferdinand was killed in 2002. Uh, she is the author of the book Monkey Business, the disturbing case that launched the animal rights business uh, movement. Excuse me, animal rights movement. Uh, Johnny Vasek is the program director of animal content and entertainment for the Humane Society of the United States. He is also the founder and president of the LA-based Evergreen Oasis Entertainment, which specializes in communication with a conscience. And he is formerly the international director at the Sea Shepherd Conservation Society. He developed the t TV series Whale Wars for Animal Planet. And then finally, Bruce Wagman is a partner in the San Francisco office of Schiff Harden. He's also a board member of CHIP Sanctuary Northwest. He has a national practice that includes animal law, and his cases have covered a broad range of issues involving animals. He is the co-editor of Animal Law, the first casebook for animal law courses, now in its fourth edition, and uh, first published in January uh, 2000, and he is also the author of A Worldview of Animal Law. So I'm very pleased to welcome the next panel of speakers. Thank you. Good, good morning. Uh, no animals were harmed. Uh, it's a phrase that's become part of the vernacular of filmmaking, although it is a legal certification that can only be awarded by American Humane Association when a production meets our criteria. Um, I hope to tell you a little bit about our program today. This will be kind of the Cliff Notes version. Um, for over 135 years, American Humane Association has one of, been one of America's leading voices for the protection of both children and animals and the power of the human-animal bond. So our programs are really built on measurable outcomes and, uh, and science, and we work with real animals in the real world every day. Um, as, as was said, I was with, I've been with American Humane for 20 years, and in that time I've watched this program uh, really advance and progress. Uh, today, um, we've made some really significant positive changes and advancements for animals working in filmed entertainment, um, basically because we are on those sets every single day, and we do intercede long before any activity reaches a level of cruelty. Uh, beginning in 1940, we continue our mission today, and that's to ensure that all animals working in film, all species, are protected under our program. Uh, we acknowledge that animals are being used in entertainment and will continue to be used in filmed entertainment. And our focus is that we will be there to uh, ensure their care and their treatment as long as they are. Um, Animals and humans have interacted on this planet uh, forever. 
and inevitably they are going to be part of the stories that filmmakers tell. We accept that and we accept the role that we will be there on set when they're used. So regardless of the debate um, that surrounds the subject of animals used in entertainment, we focus on the reality that they are on thousands of film productions worldwide every year. Uh, basically, our program is very practical. And we take the No Animals Were Harmed end credit certification very seriously. And it can only be awarded when a certified animal safety representative is on set reporting the facts of how those animals are being treated. Sometimes we do step in and we stop production. Sometimes we slow it down. Actually, sometimes we get to be present and watch some pretty terrific magic between a trainer and the animal with which it has a bond. Um, and animals perform better when they're happy, when they're free from fear, and when they are trusting of that trainer. Um, they say that the camera doesn't lie, and it doesn't. Um, you can really tell that uh, animals really, really like what they're doing when they're doing it. Um, I think that it's, you know, any broad brush statements are an over-exaggeration. To say that all animals used in entertainment work only out of fear and intimidation um, is really an over-exaggeration, and that's just not true. We see the other side of things. However, the early days of film were not so kind to animals. Um, in 1939, they used a tilt chute to plummet a horse over a 70-foot cliff to its death during the filming of Jesse James. American Humane led an outcry, and we were given the jurisdiction to protect animals in, in the filmmaking process. In 1980, we led another outcry over the use of the animals in the film Heaven's Gate. There, animals were killed, cattle were killed for, their, for its blood, for their entrails, there was real cockfighting, and a horse was blown up with dynamite. Because of that, we were given jurisdiction in the Screen Actors Guild contract, and today we oversee close to 2,000 productions every year. And I really have to say that in the domestic film production process, there is uh, basically, um, you know, cruelty is really non-existent, intentional cruelty. However, this is becoming a global industry. And what we're seeing globally is that there are diverse attitudes toward animals. And there are also non-professional suppliers of these animals, and that's creating some real challenges. Three important factors are, are what we use to monitor. It's our guidelines for the safe use of animals in film media, which are extensive. Um, our on-set monitoring by certified, qualified, knowledgeable animal safety representatives, and our certification. Um, and that encourages industry cooperation. The program today includes 38 certified animal welfare representatives throughout the U.S. with additional reps in key international locations such as Canada, New Zealand, and Sweden. Um, the staff oversees over 100,000 animals per year. All of the safety, safety reps travel extensively, and we've monitored films everywhere from the U.K. to China. We're in 43 of 50 states, including Puerto Rico. Collectively, the staff represents a wealth of animal knowledge and experience. Many hold degrees in animal science, animal behavior, uh, veterinary medicine. They've completed the Moore Park Exotic Training and Management Program. Um, they're equine specialists, they have a primatologist, and some are state humane officers. They are experienced problem solvers. That's what they do, and they take this work, believe me, very, very seriously. We monitor probably 4,000, approximately 4,000 days of animal action a year, and that is really only 65% of what we know is going on in film, commercials, television, internet-only productions, um, and that's domestically, quite frankly. Um, this translates to 100,000 animals protected a year. And quite frankly, that is a very low estimate, because on any single dip, given day, on any single set, we can have 3,000 beetles, a flock of birds, a herd of cattle, hundreds of horses, if it's a historic or a Western drama. 
Um, when there's a lead animal, like a lassie, uh, very often there are five animals that play that single animal. And that's because today the way animals are trained is to encourage natural behavior. So you'll have stunt lassie and glamour lassie and herding lassie and running lassie to play the one character. Um, and a lot of this is done with just repeat and reward. Um, no animal is forced to do anything, certainly not on our watch. Um, okay. Our guidelines for the safe use of animals in film media are actually the gold standard of care within the industry, and they're targeted to film production. Um, they are more stringent than any local, state, or federal animal welfare laws, and they are updated very regularly based on animal science, animal behavior studies, new film technology, and our own onset experience. They are guidelines, they are not laws. At the top of every day we have a safety meeting and that's where we manage expectations of producers and cast and crew and we also set some safety parameters for the day. And many factors are included. The climate, the terrain, the number of animals, the species of animals, what the script is dictating, the interaction with, with actors and the animals, it goes on and on, um, including the, in, the ability and the limitations of any individual animal that will be on that set. Special effects. We have to look at everything from the practical to the chemical. And the, these are just, you know, a handful of things that, that we look at. We ask for tests at the top of every day, and we determine what adjustments need to be made, including uh, eliminating the animal from the scene altogether. Uh, stunts, they're complicated, but animals, again, are never forced to do anything. When an animal shows signs of stress or disinterest, the animal is pulled. Um, the behaviors to animals are, are play behavior or trained behaviors or athleticism. Um, and they respond, some are food driven, some are toy driven, some respond to, to praise. Um, basically, in today's world, the best professional trainers believe in reward and repeat. Um, it is, it is uh, ba basically positive reinforcement training that is driving the industry, whether it's the professional dog trainers um, or even today some of the primate trainers. Technology has uh, afforded filmmakers a lot of opportunities to push the boundaries, but it also enables them to tell stories without harming an animal, and they're pretty stunning nowadays. Um, they can tell stories they never could tell before. In the Rum Diaries, there's a stunning cockfight that was all choreographed. In the life of Pi, which is upcoming this fall, you'll have a tiger and a child in the same lifeboat together. Um, the downside is that they can depict more horrific images um, than ever before, and that's without harming any live animal. Um, so that's a challenge. Interweaving the animatronics and the CGI and the other technological enhancements with the work of the live animal is what makes the story believable. Um, but however, that makes it even more critical for American Humane to be there to understand where those technological advancements are going to start and where the work of the live animal is going to end and be able to report that to the public. And, oh, brother, where art thou? The cow that gets hit by a car was complete CGI, but it was interwoven into the live animals actually crossing the road. Um, in Avatar, they did a lot of motion capture work with the live animals, and then they were computer enhanced to become dire horses. So comprehensive reporting is really imperative. Uh, the horse race scene, this breakdown scene in the film Dreamer, took two weeks to film, and it basically is a minute on, on the screen. Um, all of the, the racing was done in very short, tight segments that were very controlled. The live animals were conditioned to run with the animatronic animal that is on a dolly and a track and actually took the fall. And then another live animal was trained to do a lay down, which depicted the injured horse. You weave all of that together and it was really a pretty horrific scene. So, what about content? 
American Humane does not comment on the content of a script. We respect the filmmakers' First Amendment rights to tell the story they want to tell. That said, um, it's even more important for our safety reps to be there. Uh, for something like the cockfighting scene I mentioned, country, it would be unacceptable and illegal to do something like that. Not so in Puerto Rico, where they filmed. However, the filmmakers listened to us, and they choreographed the scenes because we knew that they could do it humanely, and they must do it in simulated ways, not real fighting. We process over 3,000 scripts a year, and we start by identifying what animals will be used, and what they're going to be expected to do. So we work with trainers in pre-production on the more complex stunts and work that they do. Um, and we work with production in trying to plan the best safety and make recommendations for that safety. Um, sometimes we have weeks or months to, to do all this planning. Sometimes we have hours, minutes. We'll arrive on the set to find out what they're doing and who they're doing it with. Um, so advertisers know, though, we, we see a lot of animals in commercials, and it's because advertisers know that animals are going to grab people's attention. Nowadays, family shows are always going to have a pet. There's more pet owners in the country than ever before in history. And horses are really prevalent. Horses are complicated. They have been man's transportation, war machines, farm equipment, companions, athletic champions, pets, and mythic icons. So horses got us into this business, and quite frankly, horses are the most at-risk animal today in film. That is mainly because of their historic breath, and also because of the way horses are built. As powerful as they are, they are incredibly fragile. And rarely, rarely do we see one horse being used. Usually when horses are used, they're in multiples. Um, for the film uh, War Horse, for instance, that depicted the horrific toll on equine life. Eight million horses died in that mechanized warfare. Um, it took months of preparation and months on set to choreograph all of that and weave the technology with the work of the trained live animals. Um, so it's a blending of technology and live action that is really happening today. Our track record for safety is really excellent. Um, we have a 99.98% track record when animal injuries are involved. It goes down to 99.96 when cast and crew are involved. And I beg, beg, beg actors to please learn to ride. Our stats would be better, the animal would be better served, and so would they. However, with the best safety in place, accidents happen. Um, in three years, with over 300,000 animals protected, we reported 35 incidents of accidental deaths. Four of those involved horses. But it's the horses that receive the most public scrutiny. The most recent and most publicized incidents were three thoroughbreds that died on the set of the HBO television series Luck. And this happened over a two-year period. It was also unprecedented for our program. Luck dramatized the world of horse racing, and it included scripted races in every one of the episodes that they filmed. This is more than any racing in a secretariat or uh, a single movie. Um, and, and over 50 horses were used, and they were supplied by a racetrack trainer. Again, this was unusual for us. Um, these race horses were not the recommended movie horses that we generally work with and we prefer. Movie horses are conditioned over a period of time for the sights and sounds and smells of a movie set. And they're slowly exposed to the stimuli so that they become desensitized, less reactive, and safer for themselves and for the people that work with them. American Humane, especially in this case, does not make hiring decisions for production. We do not dictate the script content, nor the look or the art direction of the show. Yes, we made recommendations. In the case of Luck, stock footage was deemed absolutely out of the question, since the races themselves were an integral part of the script, 
Each race was scripted very specifically, and they had a look that they wanted to achieve for the show. So we had our challenge from the, from the get-go with this particular show. During filming of the pilot, before they even knew they were going to episode, um, we set limitations on the length and the speed of the runs, and after weeks and weeks of filming just this one pilot episode, on the last day, the last shot of the day, cameras were off, the jockey was slowing the horse down to bring it back to the barn. It appears that the, that the horse threw a shoe, tripped, fell, and suffered um, a, a catastrophic injury. The veterinarians who were actually on the trek were right there with the horse. They administered drugs to mitigate pain and suffering and shock. Uh, they determined that the best course of action, as you heard in the first panel, unfortunately was euthanasia for this type of break. Um, a complete necropsy was done, and the accident was deemed an accidental death. But once we learned that it was going to series months later, we put some really stringent um, protections in place. We limited the production to a core group of horses. No horse was to be professionally raced as when it was part of the cast. That we needed veterinary sign off every day for the health of the horse and tattoo identification. Um, the runs, again, were only partial lengths of the track. They were at slower speeds. Um, and each horse was only allowed two runs per day. So when you do the math, the reason we needed tattoo identification, and later you'll see we asked for microchipping of the horses, was because for any single horse in a race, you needed three horses to perform. Six horses in a race, three groups of horses. That's a lot of horses that have to look alike because they have to match when they edit it all together. Very difficult for the reps out there in the field to make those identifications. However, in spite of all the precautions during the seventh episode, another horse in its second run of the day had a breakdown. Uh, same thing, catastrophic. It was given uh, drugs to mitigate pain and suffering, and um, it was unfortunately euthanized. However, American Humane said that all production needed to cease. No more running until we had a necropsy, no more running until we put further protocols in place. HBO complied. We added 51 additional safety protocols, and these are stricter than anything that's happening in the horse racing industry. They were in addition to what we already had in place in our guidelines, and they included things like radiographing the legs of all the horses to look for pre-existing conditions. Um, we had extra veterinarians for race day and weekly checkups, medical records, and we microchipped all the horses to be able to quickly identify them. Um, however, with all the new protocols in place, with the horses getting a hiatus, when they started the second season at the top of uh, the day, starting the second episode, um, another horse had a catastrophic accident in the stabling area. It was early morning, for those who know horses, they're frisky, prancing, it reared, lost its footing, and the first thing it hit was, it, was its head, and sadly had to be euthanized. So all three accidents, where am I here? <laughs> all three accidents were investigated by American Humane. Um, our senior state humane officer uh, did the investigations, including the third accident, and reported all these findings to the local law enforcement authorities. Uh, we did not find any evidence of criminal activity. However, our expanded protocols became for the racing industry exemplary, and we've been told by people who are looking for reform in the horse racing industry that our protocols are exemplary. So hopefully they'll, they'll catch on. Um, our program exists to protect these animals, and when anything like this happens, we are absolutely devastated. Those people in the field are real animal advocates, and it, it's tragic for them to be out there when anything like this happens. However, this, uh, this show was very high profile, and uh, there was an awful lot of press. And included in that press were what we believe were a lot of false allegations about the work of the American Humane Association and what was really happening with these horses. One of the allegations was that the horses were drugged to run. The necropsy showed that the drugs were administered after the severe breakdown to mitigate pain and shock. 
They were not administered um, to mask pain before the horse ran. The allegation was that humane officers should have brought criminal charges. We had three state humane officers that were on a rotation and there throughout the whole first season. In fact, there was a humane officer present at the soundness check at the top of the day on each day when we had those breakdowns. We had a senior humane officer also um, do all the investigations of, of these uh, of the breakdowns that occurred. Allegation was that sick and unfit horses were used regularly. On our watch, there were no unfit or sick horses that were allowed to work. They are pulled. They are not allowed to work for the day. Um, if there is any indication of medication or drugging, those horses too are pulled. Um, when one of our reps saw a severely uh, underweight horse, they pulled it, and that horse was not allowed to work until it gained weight and was deemed medically fit. That horse never did work in the show. Um, the allegation was that horses had pre-existing conditions. Uh, Dr. Susan Stover, who is one of the head veterinarians in charge of racing industry knee proxies at the University of California at Davis, deemed that the two fractures were atypical for racehorses. And I quote Dr. Stover. Fractures occur in very consistent locations because they often happen in pre-existing injuries. They are like occupational injuries. These two particular fractures were not typical. They would be rare fractures in racehorses. So the fact is that serious incidents are extremely rare in filmmaking, domestic filmmaking today. Um, and yet, in the real world, accidents happen. So over this two-year period, um, yes, we, we lost three horses on this show. But what is our power? Our power is that we can shut down production, we can remove animals from the set, we can demand veterinary care, and we can withhold our certification no animals were harmed. Um, we also have ratings that accompany the certification. That's another whole conversation, I think. But uh, for something like Men in Black, when we arrived on set, 13 fish were already dead. Four huge aquatic tanks were disgustingly filthy. We made sure that they were completely removed, completely overhauled. We called in an aquatic vet. He treated the rest of the fish in hospital tanks. No further fish died. However, because of what we encountered when we arrived, the film got a modified certification, which was we monitored the film. And that's all we said. We don't say no animals were harmed. And we rated it unacceptable. So the truth is that our oversight really is very effective. And we are continuing to evolve in this process. We formed a scientific advisory committee, which I can talk about at another time. Um, in the case of exotic animals, we realize there's just a myriad of problems. And what we are seeking to do is set training guidelines for the, the training of all species. We would like a certification program for the trainers that work in the industry. And we would like to look at a retirement program for those animals who no longer are able to work in this profession. So, um, you know, we don't really talk about all this stuff. We're, we're there on the front lines every day. And um, to tell you the truth, it's a pretty monumental task. Um, but we, we insist that if they're going to be used, we need to be there. So in the words of John Turtletop, the director of National Treasure, nothing should be harmed to make a movie. It's a movie. Nothing should be hurt. Nothing should be killed. Thank you. Johnny Vasek, and I am a recovering producer of TV and film. Um, welcome. Thank you to um, Brett and the Paul University for having us here. It's really cool to be a part of the panel. I'm not a big PowerPoint guy, so I'm going to show a, a, a video clip here in a few minutes. 
I'm just giving a sampling of the type of work I do. It's a little bit different from some of our other panelists. And um, I basically work with a lot of nonprofits, <clears throat> especially animal-related nonprofits, to help get animal issues into TV and film. And I run a company called Evergreen Oasis Entertainment that specializes in that. And I worked with you know lots of different NGOs. Um, in full disclosure, since there's some lawyers in the room and future lawyers, I guess, um, I'm currently working with PETA, which doesn't stand for People Eating Tasty Animals. It actually stands for People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals. But I've, my former job was with the Humane Society of the United States, and I worked in the ACE department there. Um, so in the spirit of debates, I thought I would go second, since I'm sure we're going to have if you guys don't have questions, I'm sure we'll have questions for each other. And it's a bit of a controversial topic, to, to be sure. Um, who here has an animal at home, or a companion animal, or so-called pet? Yeah, fair number. And, and out of those, who, who has a dog? And how about a cat? Just that was, that's the audience participation part of it, it's out of the way. <laughs> so, uh, making a movie is really tough. Making, I specialize with documentaries and reality-based programming. And um, making a good TV show or a good movie is really, really a challenge. And uh, it reminds me of a joke by the, the late, great, uh, famous director and producer, Sidney Pollack. And it goes something like, there's two brain surgeons in a room and they're scrubbing up, getting ready for their surgery and one of them's a little bit new and he says, man, I'm really, really nervous about this brain surgery, Bob. You know, what are we going to do? And uh, Bob says, he goes, I don't worry about it. It's not like we're making TV and movies. <laughs> so for me, you know, personally, I, I can't wait till the day that racing, horse racing and, and dog racing ends. I don't believe in exotics and entertainment, period. I'm not, I'm not of that, with very few exceptions. I'm a 20-year vegan vegetarian, and so I, I try to practice that in my everyday life. And so my my specialty comes in, like I was saying, getting issues into TV and film. There's some very, very few exceptions. Um, so I, I work with a lot of documentary type stuff. So just. Um, to uh, give you an example of the type of things I work on and some of the projects, you know, I've, I've worked with filmmakers or, or produced myself, I thought I'd just show this short little video here. something about it to stop this. So I began documenting reefs around the world. The dolphin is captured and put in a concrete tank surrounded by a stadium full of screaming people. I wanted to have a three-dimensional experience of what's going on in that lagoon. But I wanted to hear everything that the dolphins were doing, everything that the whalers were saying. The effort wasn't just to show the slaughter. You want to capture something that will make people change. That meat is being processed by huge multinational corporations that have very little to do with ranches and farmers. Now our food is coming from enormous assembly lines where the animals and the workers are being abused. This isn't farming, this is just mass production like an assembly line in a factory. I understand why farmers don't want to talk um, because the company can do what it wants to do as far as pay goes since they control everything. Um, but it's just gotten to the point that it's not right what's going on, and I've just made up my mind. I'm going to say what I have to say. Um, I understand why others don't want to do it. The reality is the rats have taken over his home. 
However, another reality is that he loves these rats. He literally sees them as his family and his children. So, how many do you think we've taken? I'd, I'd say total, we're, we're close to 2,000, because they were around 2,000 rats. Yeah, you look surprised, but yeah. we need to get them on the way to the shelter um, because you know they're getting a little stressed being in these smaller travel containers, so we don't want to keep them too long in that situation. Animals kept behind bars, even drugged, then shot for sport. They hope to document this cruelty on film and stop it once and for all. We want to show that the animal has no means of getting away. Uh, probably 25 lives, 35 or 40 animals that are in the last two weeks. When I saw the syringe, it was like, hey, we're documenting something that we have never documented before. We're in the heart of America. We have vipers here, we have baboons, you have lions, tigers, everything. And you would never think it is here in America, but it is here and it is rampant and it's run wild. If we can't change the minds of these people that are afraid, we're going to lose. The Congress of the United States needs to address this problem in law. It needs to address what I'm going to show you. I'm not going to pay attention to that. Then I take it from my list of people that I care about and put them on the list of the people I need to take out. People will come to my house. The last thing they say is, Damn, you gotta be nuts if you wanna keep one of these. Why? My 34 years of experience in situations uh, where you've looked and seen all the pieces come together. You can see it, you know it. It's gonna happen. projects I worked on. So I have a 20 year background in, in TV and film. Um, I, I've worked my way up through the ranks. I've been on uh, many sets with uh, AHA certification with the no animals were harmed, mostly with domesticated animals. Um, I kind of had my aha moment back in 2005, I guess it was. I was up on the Canadian ice flows in northeastern Canada, the Gulf of St. Lawrence. We were about 200 miles out, or 100 miles out, and the ice was all frozen over. I was up there with Seashore Conservation Society trying to get them to get the sealers to stop clubbing harp seals. And I was actually there as a vegan cook on a vegan ship. And uh, but I found myself out on the ice floes with a camera in my hand, and we were trying to talk to the sealers and document what was happening. And uh, you know, there, a fight ensued, and the sealers started beating up on us, and the police showed up. The Royal Mounted Canadian Police, the Mounties, showed up and then started arresting all of the activists. I made my way back to the ship and quickly edited a video, and that ended up being broadcast around the world. And that was sort of my aha light bulb moment where I realized I could take my skills as a producer and a director and combine those with my love of animals and my activism. And I sort of changed my course of my career at that point. And I started this company and started looking at ways I could I could do that. So unlike some of our panelists or people in the audience, you know, the course, I'm not really, you know, I don't have a law background. I'm not looking at, you know, what laws are being broken within using animals in entertainment. My focus is more as looking where, where there's really issues that needed to be need to be exploited and then using mass media as a way to bring that to the forefront as you can see in many of those films. So a good example of that is that last clip of uh, Elephant in the Living Room where we, this is taking place in Ohio where there's basically no, ex, you know, no laws on exotic ownership of animals. You have to get a, a license to register your dog to own a dog but you don't have to do that to own a lion or a tiger, or a baboon. 
And so I was working with the, the filmmakers of this film, and once the film was finished, we used that up on the, up on the um, you know, to lobby, you know, the state legislature and the governor to try to put laws in place. And the governor actually, after seeing this movie, signed an executive order to restrict the, the use of animals um, being owned as, you know, pets, exotic animals. Um, the House overturned that law, and then, but they've been battling it back and forth, and now I think it's just back in place now. Um, and so that's a really good example of being able to use, you know, TV or film, documentary film in that instance, to get laws changed that help animals for the positive. And uh, Rat Hoarders was another example of this guy that had 2,000 rats in his house, and they started off as pets, and they had gotten out of control at some point, and just took over his house, and he actually moved out of his house. And so the Humane Society's animal rescue team went in to try to get all those animals out of there. Usually, when that rescue team goes in, there's a legal consequence. It's because the law, the humane laws are being broken somehow. Um, and that, in that specific instance, there's probably more health codes being broken. Uh, rats don't have a whole lot of protection in this country, but um, they sure are smart and cute little guys. Although you had to tape your pant legs when you walked in, because otherwise they'd go running up your pant leg to try to find a little nesting area. And in order to catch them, you know, you'd put out pieces of fruit. They really love fruit, and um, they would come out and grab the fruit, and then you'd, you know, grab them by the tail and put them in the van and take them out, sex them, and separate the. the the males from the females, and um, but they're really smart, so the ones that scurry back into the walls would tell their little rat buddies, and <laughs> next thing you know, that technique didn't work anymore because they adapt really quickly. Their, their intelligence is that of like a dog or a pig. So, um, out of that two, out of those 2,000 rats, you know, several hundred had to be euthanized because they were just unhealthy or, or just completely weren't going to survive their suffering, but we were able to adopt out about 16 rats out of that uh, pod, so it's, it's pretty amazing. Um, so, like I was saying before, I'm not really a big believer in, you know, in exotics and entertainment. Um, obviously, they're, when you document them and doc, as a documentary filmmaker and producer, you can see they're, they can end up in entertainment in, in these ways, but I'm not for manipulating animals in that way. I think it's even beyond legal and as future lawyers, I think it's good to look at not only what the laws are now, but what the laws should be or what they can become. And it's not for me just a legal issue, but a moral and ethical issue. So I'm sure we'll get into a little more debating as we go. And we've all decided to try to keep our initial first to 15 minutes so we have time for you all to ask questions. Um, but, you know, so I think, like, you know, I'm glad there's a lot of different groups out there. I don't think any one group knows how to make sure animals aren't suffering and aren't being abused or exploited in TV and film especially, let alone in circuses and all these other things. I'm glad AHA is there because they serve a, a vital function. Um, I wish that we had more stringent rules and whether it regards to racing or on set certification, some of the problems I faced is before and after. So what's happening to the animal before and what's happening to the animal after they leave set? And that's a really big challenge. And as a producer, the certification really uh, you know, puts the, the onus on the production company to make sure the trainer is doing the right thing, that they don't have any USDA violations and things like that. Um, but having said that, you know, diversity in the movement is key, so I'm glad we have diversity. And there's been good examples of films where they could have used animals where they didn't, like Planet of the Apes, for example, where they chose at some added cost to use all CGI apes in that movie, which was great because it's really difficult to have, especially primates or monkeys, you know, capuchin monkeys, these kinds of things, and just have positive reward. I mean, it's just not practical in my brain. I haven't seen a way to get a, a wild animal to respond in a positive way without some kind of negative reinforcement. And that might not happen on the set, but it certainly seems to be happening before they get to the set, in, in my view. 
So, um, a, you know, a, a real world example of this is I'll sometimes work with um, writers and directors in TV shows. So, like Hawaii Five O, we're working with them to do a storyline about exotics. Um, they've done it. They've done a couple of cool things like that. So, we'll work with them to try to get them to include more themes, or say Extreme Makeover Home Edition, uh, which is not on the air anymore, but that ran for like nine seasons, and I worked with those producers a lot because they wanted to do an episode where a capuchin monkey is like a certain, as a service monkey is going to help this disabled person. Well, as I talked to experts and researchers, there's just absolutely no way to train that monkey to do that without serious negative consequences for the monkey. And so the producers, after being provided with all the information, decided not to do an episode based on that. And so that's, that always makes me feel really good. So a lot of the times the work we do or that I do is stuff you never get to see because of that, because of the choices that are made. Unlike the show Animal Practice, where they're using a capuchin monkey, uh, monkeys are known to bite. Those particular monkeys bite a lot. And oftentimes they'll pull their teeth just so that they don't get bit, especially for people that use them as, you know, has them as pets in their homes. Mm. So it's a real challenge. So that's one where we've, you know, I've gone after that show personally as well as with the groups I work with because it's just the comedy value, no matter how great it is, in my mind, is not worth the animal being exploited in that way or harmed. So a lot to put in, a lot of onus is put into sort of the physical aspect, are they being hurt on set and these types of things, And but we don't tend to play into the psychological aspect much. We don't know if the animal's really enjoying that or not. We don't know if it's not their choice to be there. We don't understand their voice. Animals have a voice, we just can't understand what they're saying um, a lot of times. So that's where, that's where for me, I don't, I don't like that aspect of it. So I'm, I'm a big believer in trying to get wildlife out of entertainment, trying to get animals out of entertainment. So um, I rest my case. <laughs> Thank you. I'm Kathy Guillermo. I'm with PETA. And I'm going to talk about luck today. And I'm going to give you a little bit different perspective than the one you've heard already. And I, I want to just start off by saying, as you can probably guess, PETA is opposed to the use of animals in film and television. We're categorically opposed to the use of exotics. We understand that to some extent animals will be used for the foreseeable future. We are not in the business of overseeing film production, and we don't want to be in that business. But what, we, what has happened in recent months is that we have had so many whistleblower calls and they're talking about this. Earlier this year, and you know by now that there were three deaths of horses on Locke, and that the show was canceled after the third death was made public. What happened with PETA and how we got involved, in, and one thing Karen didn't say is that the allegations that were made in the papers were the allegations of these whistleblowers, and they were made through PETA. I went to the media with those allegations because I felt it should be public and that HBO and the production company should be held accountable for the deaths of these animals. What we learned early this year, uh, and we learned this from a variety of sources, is that horses being used on this set were not in good shape and were not being treated well. And these allegations came from more than half a dozen whistleblowers. Some of them worked on the racetrack. Some of them worked in the production company. Some of them had worked for American Humane Association. I think in the beginning, when these problems were uncovered, the AHA representatives who were humane officers worked diligently and very hard to correct those issues. Some of these issues were that the horses used were former racehorses who were out of shape. Uh, and let me just show you, first of all, a couple of the horses who died so that you can get an idea of what we're talking about. Outlaw Yodler, and these photos were leaked to us. This was a, a thoroughbred horse who had not raced in more than a year. The necropsy report showed that this horse, while not very old, had arthritis, which is quite common in the racing world in young horses because of how very brutal that sport is on horses' legs and on their bodies. 
uh, alcohol yodeler, hadn't raced in more than a year, as I said, and so was out of shape. And we call it acting, but when a horse goes through a starting gate, that's a race to the horse. Horses don't race more than once a day, and this horse was put through the starting gate twice, and it was on that second start that his leg was broken. This is Mark Shadow. Mark Shadow was even older and had not raced in more than three years. He had been used, we believe, and uh, whistleblowers say, as what's called an outrider pony, which is the horse who leads the horses onto the track. His shoes were not the, the lightweight racing shoes. They were heavy riding shoes. Uh, and he also was put through the starting gate twice. The third horse was a thoroughbred called Real Awesome Jet. And this is the horse who reared up and fell backwards on her head. Now, what we heard from whistleblowers earlier this year is that these horses were out of shape, as I've said. We heard also that some of them were not treated properly. And again, I reiterate what Karen said. These were not show business horses. These were not trained horses used to being on the film set. These were former racehorses, and they were provided by the trainer named Matthew Chu, who's a racehorse trainer. The veterinarian who was in charge was hired, we, have, we understand, by both Mr. Chu and by HBO. Uh, and this, is, this photo is allegedly Shiva, who was underweight, and the American Humane Officer on the set, uh, this California State Humane Officer, complained about the fact that this horse was underweight. This is Book of Love, another horse who was underweight and being used. When we first heard these allegations, we immediately went to the production company. And let me just go back a moment and say when we understood the show was going to be filmed, we went to the production company and encouraged them to use stock footage and encouraged them not to do these racing scenes, which we felt might be dangerous. Uh, that was uh, ignored. When the allegations came to us earlier this year, we went to the production company, we went to Dustin Hoffman, who was the star of the program, and we went to HBO. And we got a response from HBO, who answered our initial questions. And when we asked to see the necropsy reports on the horses and asked other follow-up questions, they stopped talking to us. Uh, and that was when two horses had died. This was before the third horse. Um, the, the allegations, to go back to the original allegations, uh, horses' identities were allegedly uh, held, uh, switched. Tattoo numbers were switched. Tattoo numbers did not match the names of the horses. Uh, horses who were sick suddenly would disappear from the set. Um, horses were improperly prepared to race. Uh, one horse put through a starting gate had never been through a starting gate before in his life, we are told, which is a very dangerous situation for both the horse and the jockey to put a horse through a gate who hasn't been properly schooled for that. Um, we have, uh, we understand that the veterinarian was uh, very casual about uh, checking on these horses to help and reporting it, and I show you uh, the initial, what were leaked to us as the initial veterinary uh, records for the, when she checked the horses and approved them for use, this is what the uh, initial reports look like, and this was one of the two horses I showed you who was underweight, and this is the second one. The California Humane Officer got involved and insisted on uh, better records. And this gives you an idea of what was done after that, a thorough veterinary check. This is what needed to be done on every horse. Um, obviously, this didn't prevent the injuries that happened. We understand that uh, what happened after the first two deaths, which were shocking enough, and which certainly weren't made public, the second one was certainly not made public, Inexplicably, the American Humane Officers, uh, the American Humane uh, Association fired the California Humane Officers who had uh, supervised the first season. Now, this was inexplicable to us because we could see that while there were serious issues with the use of these horses that had led to the deaths of at least two of these horses, at least there was somebody on set who was trying to make sure that it didn't happen again. These people were let go. And again and again, I was contacted by whistleblowers, by email, by a letter, by a phone call. Again and again, for a period of three months, people telling me the horses are not properly prepared, they're old, they're unfit, they're injured, they're drugged, they're underweight, they're tranquilized, and there's going to be another death. At this point, we called HBO again. 
and we said, we urge you, please, to put a California State Humane Officer on the set. And the reason we felt this was important is that a humane officer has the power to cite someone when there is a violation of the law. We felt that a humane officer could shut down the production if they needed to and make sure that if another horse like Mark Shadow or Outlaw Yodler, the two first horses who died, were put through a starting gate again, it could be stopped. HBO ignored that. And at that point, I began to go to the media. And I couldn't get anybody to pay attention to me in the media. After the first two deaths, there was a huge media outcry. When I went back to media and said, we are hearing that the situation on the set is dire, that another horse is going to die if something is not done, no one paid attention. And then a third horse died two days following my attempt to get media to be interested. And if you were, if you were aware of the media at the time, it was extensive. And at that point, HBO decided to cut its loss and cancel the program, which I think was a very wise move on their part. As Karen said, horses are particularly vulnerable on the set, but certainly the deaths of the horses on luck, which were preventable and which were tragic, have happened on other sets, and they've happened on other sets when there have been representatives from AHA on that set. It was reported in the Los Angeles Times and in newspapers in New Zealand. The three horses died during the filming of The Hobbit, which is to be released in December. I've heard from whistleblowers that a horse died on the set of a Hallmark film called Love's Resounding Victory, I think is the name of it, Love's Resounding Dream. Uh, thank you, Love's Resounding Courage. Uh, I understand that there have been other deaths that we, we, we don't know what the cause of them was. We take the word of the people who talk to us to some extent, but we'd like to see necropsy reports. Horses are incredibly vulnerable on these sets. And what happened in the wake of luck was an outpouring of whistleblower calls. Allegations involving more than 16 films and problems with production companies and problems with oversight. And this is something we're trying to deal with now. It's not something we wanted to get into, but it shows you what the difficulties are, both with the production companies, who are not being responsible in many cases about their use of animals, and the problems with oversight on these sets. So I think there's much work to be done if animals are going to continue to be used. The best thing would be not to use them at all. There's much work to be done on the part of the production companies when horses are going to be used particularly. And the best thing of all would be, uh, as, as uh, we, uh, Johnny was talking about earlier, is CGI to be used whenever possible. And that would eliminate so many of these accidents where fortunate technology has brought us there. Um, just one more word about the difficulty, since this is a, a law school, the difficulties and the legal issues here is that we don't have standing to sue on these cases. We filed reports with the district attorney's office, the law enforcement uh, in the area of the Santa Anita racetrack where Luck was filmed is the Pasadena Humane Society. We filed a complaint with them. We filed a complaint with the California State Veterinary Board over the actions of the veterinarian. And we filed a complaint with the California State Racing Board since it happened at a track and since there were racehorses and trainers involved. We're still waiting on the results of those. We understand the veterinary complaint is still being investigated. But what we can do legally is very limited. And that's, of course, frustrating for us because the animals, as you know, can't go to court for themselves. So thank you very much. And I'll look forward to any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Um, I'm the one lawyer here. I'm not sure if I'll be the most boring, but it's likely. Um, Fascinating stuff, and it's a real honor to be here. I think when we talk about cruelty in America and cruelty to animals, we've got this 
tolerance continuum up there, which is the more we are willing to say that's not okay, the more likely we are, we are to change things. And so uh, I, I think we can probably more or less agree, or even if we can't, this is my continuum, um, that most, um, uh, the largest percentage of Americans will say, if animals have to be harmed to cure my mother's cancer, I'm okay with that. But if animals have to be abused so I can laugh at something on TV, I'm not okay with that. And so, in some ways, although, as everybody's talked about, and I'll talk about as well, it's very hard to change things with respect to entertainment, it is possibly the lowest hanging fruit. Because most people will say, I'm not okay with watching a chimpanzee smile in a movie, and then finding out that he was taken away from his mother at birth and beaten so I could see him smile. And for better or for worse, that's the story I have to tell from, from multiple uh, experience and witnesses. Um, so be prepared, because I'm going to ruin your viewing entertainment and pleasure forever today, if you believe what I have to say. Um, I think these are the questions that we face when we're addressing animals and entertainment issues. There is the legal question, and we've talked about how that is difficult. Is it animal cruelty? But even if it is an animal cruelty, because that's a very high bar, is it something that we're willing to accept uh, when we watch these shows, once we find out what's going on. And one of the biggest problems is we don't know what's going on. Um, this process for me has been a real education working on these cases. And in working on the cases and getting educated, I found out that I personally wasn't willing to accept a lot of what's going on. First, I want to talk about a couple of major cases, sort of get the, some of the legal issues out of the way, and then mainly I'm going to talk about exotic animals and entertainment and chimpanzees in particular. A, a lot of uh, the issues around animals being depicted in, in videos, starting in California with crush videos. And just because I'm never sure if everybody understands uh, all the terms of art we use, crush videos are videos in which the lower part of a woman's leg is shown while she crushes to death a small mouse or rat, sometimes a bird. Um, and believe it or not, these are very, very popular. They are entertainment, although possibly nobody in this room thinks that's entertainment. Entertainment is something people enjoy, and Mr. Thomas, the defendant in this case in California, was selling thousands of these videos uh, for good money, and, and crush videos are very popular. However, uh, despite his attempts to get out of the conviction, the California appellate court decided that crush videos were not acceptable. Really going back to my first question, the question of whether that was okay, you know it wasn't okay to put this kind of video on and to torture this animal on video. Now, it really raises for me some very interesting questions, because these mice actually suffered a lot less than a mouse you might catch in a trap and let sit in your house for a while, or in a glue trap. They were killed pretty quickly, and somebody really enjoyed watching it. But we decide, just like we do with things like obscenity, that's not okay. And so Mr. Thomason was convicted. This led to a, a federal law signed by Bo Clinton that was initially intended to just focus on uh, crush videos, but became much broader. As you can see, the depiction of animal cruelty was uh, prohibited. And that led to this case in the United States Supreme Court, U.S. v. Stevens. Mr. Stevens was selling videos of dog fighting. Um, so dog fighting, again, good family entertainment for an awful lot of Americans. Okay, maybe again, not anybody in this room, but cockfighting and dog fighting, legal or not, are entertainment. And until recently, cockfighting was legal in some states. So Mr. Stevens, though, was showing videos that he hadn't necessarily been involved in the creation of, and that were of dogfighting, and the United States Supreme Court said that the statute as written was far too broad because it covered First Amendment protected activities. Interestingly, in the Third Circuit, which was the Third Circuit opinion, which was uh, eventually overruled or changed by the United States Supreme Court, they said that animal cruelty wasn't a big issue, or wasn't a big enough issue to address, uh, to combat First Amendment issues. Uh, but the Supreme Court simply said it was overbroad, and pretty quickly after that, as some of you may know, the statute was redrafted, focusing solely on crush videos, and we expect that that one will be upheld. Okay, so now we're going to shift, like I said, to exotic animals, and specifically I've done a lot of work with chimpanzees and entertainment. Um, so a specific case I'm going to talk about, and a specific species. But this really just illustrates what happens, especially with all wild and exotic animals, <coughs> I believe, who are used in entertainment. Um, there's an important distinction for sure between domestic animals and wild animals, and we'll talk about that. Chimps have, as many of you may know, have been identified as sort of the, the target species to make the first steps forward for animal law, whether it's in issues of personhood or in the areas of biomedical research where they've been getting a lot of attention in the last few years, or in entertainment. One of the reasons is we think we know they're so like us. Um, 
little known or well known fact for some of you maybe, we share 98.7% of the DNA with chimpanzees. Uh, my wife's t-shirt says she is 98.7% chip. Um, and so because of their similarity to us, we feel like there's a need to at least either target them for greater protection or at least identify them as the first step. Now when, when you're thinking about wild animals in entertainment, we can think about the legal issues, which again are tough, but I think some of it just amounts to some logic. These are chimpanzees in Gombe in Tanzania. Chimpanzees who live a life that's as complex as ours. Young chimpanzees stay with their moms for eight years. They have an incredibly intricate family lives and cultures. This is a chimpanzee who's been beaten senseless, so he can do that, so he can watch it and smile on TV. Um, it's unnatural, and you don't have to be a scientist, although the scientists will testify and verify that this chimpanzee had to be beaten to do this. You really don't have to be a scientist to realize that this is completely unnatural. It's illogical. This is not what chimpanzees do. How do they do this? They do this because, again, they have been abused, and we'll go into some detail and some testimony. And there's one way only to get it done. All the experts say that the only way to get chimpanzees and other wild animals to perform for us on set is to beat them senseless, is to take them away from their mothers day one, and then beat them and psychologically and physically abuse them. So that on set, everything looks okay. But it's beforehand where the real trouble is. These animals are not enjoying what they do on set. Here's just a couple of quotes. This is a guy who was a Tarzan. Many Tarzans, many chimpanzees who were uh, the chimpanzee who worked with Tarzan. The kind of thing that happens. If they're not behaving, they're taken off. Something happens behind a closed door, and they come back on, and then they behave. That kind of thing is repeated on a regular basis. And again, this is from significant undercover testimony and whistleblowers who came from the industry came forward and said, I can't do this anymore. Here's a quote from Roger Fouts, probably the country's uh, leading expert on captive chimpanzees. Uh, he's the guy who did washout and all the uh, human communication with chimpanzees. And again, here's him uh, observing animals on set and understanding. If you look at them closely, they're not enjoying things. So let's talk about the Yost case. And I, I guess just one more thing uh, from Roger, or off of that Roger thing. We had a, a meeting for the uh, Hollywood industry that was uh, that first slide I showed you about ser um, serving a life sentence to serve us, to entertain us. And at that uh, meeting, Wendy Malloch, who's an actress, came forward and she said that she had been on set with a chimpanzee, one of the chimpanzees who we were investigating in this particular case, and that she knew something was wrong the whole time. She knew this chimpanzee just didn't look right, but she, she couldn't figure out why. Uh, and after this particular meeting, she changed her mind and realized she did know why, and she was simply denying what was going on. So we're going to talk a little bit about this case, uh, the Yost case. Sid, Sid Yost is what uh, we call a trainer, I call an abuser. He's a man who takes animals and abuses them so that they can perform on set. Um, and the story of the Yost case starts with uh, a group uh, called the Chimpanzee Collaboratory, who contacted me and said they were going to send someone in to investigate any given trainer in Hollywood. And this woman, whose name is, is Sarah Beckler, simply called around to trainers who were doing this kind of work in Hollywood, and Yost was the first one who said, well, come on down. So for about a year and a half, she spent two days a week with uh, Mr. Yost and saw what was going on. She didn't target him, she simply went there and she watched what was happening. But this, we found out, Yost was, first of all, not the worst of them all, and what he was doing was simple an simply an example of what was happening everywhere. This is sworn testimony as to what, the ha what happens to chimpanzees in order for them to get on set. Sworn testimony not just from Sarah Beckler, who was the undercover investigator, but from people who were trained by and worked with Mr. Yost, and again said, it's too much, I can't do this anymore. I submit that no matter what is going on with animals and entertainment, this is not something we should accept to get a chimpanzee to smile for us. And these are just excerpts from uh, the complaint and from the testimony. <coughs> and some more. Um, whoops, sorry. Uh, how do I do that? The current slide. There we go, okay. You see, you see the allegations, I'm not gonna read them for you. Hit them as hard as you can. Hit them in the face, you can't hurt them. Hit them in places where they're not going to be hurt. Take a look at 37 there. Uh, about Taya. Now, 
as you can see, long cut in her eyebrow. Taya disappeared for a week or two and came back with stitches all stitched up. And, and I want to set up the, the scene for you as well. Mr. Yost is about, uh, having sat with him for 15 or 18 hours of deposition, he's about that high and just as wide almost. Big, big guy, okay? That's Taya. And that's actually Taya a year after he inflicted that wound on her. So this is not about what you sometimes hear, you have to deal with the animals because they're so strong. This is beating a little baby chimpanzee because the reason was, he testified, she was acting like a chimpanzee and he needed to control her so that when she get on, got on set, everything would look okay. Um, that's how chimpanzees in entertainment are trained. Here's another one. You know that smile? This is really going to ruin it for you. You know that smile we all see? They're so cute, they're smiling. It's actually called a fear grimace. They're scared to death of who's on the other side of that set. Because Mr. Yost is on the set on the other side from where the camera is. And the chimpanzee knows if I don't behave, I'm going to get hit. So we see the fear grins. So that fancy smile, no, that is I'm scared to death. The chimpanzees don't smile with both sets of teeth. It's, it's simply a fact of science. But again, we don't know that. Because we're just sitting there watching the TV, and this looks like something like a chimpanzee who's really happy. Um, so the point is not here what's going on on set. But before it's on set, where AHA doesn't have access, where they're not able to monitor, this kind of stuff is going on all the time. All those allegations I showed you were offset long before anything happened. That's the only way to prepare these animals. So in the Yost case, we had several problems. One was Yost was in control and possession of the animals, even though someone else owned them, one of our plaintiffs, and he absconded with them. Another one is the problems of standing. And so, we sat around and tried to figure out how can you get some kind of prosecution or get a case going. And in fact, we first went to the district attorney. We went to the district attorney with all of those allegations you saw. And he, he didn't say, I don't believe him. He said, it's, that's not enough for animal abuse. <coughs> now, I think he was wrong. But that's what a California district attorney said, that all that beating was not enough to qualify as animal cruelty in California. So we came up with some creative ideas. Um, and I'm going to run out of time, so I'm going to do this really quick. Uh, there's a, an exemption for the treatment of captive chimpanzees under the Native Species Act, but we argued an exemption to the exemption. That is, while they're generally not covered, there should be an exemption if they're being hit with locks and sticks and bats and kicked in the head. Um, we also used the fact that animals are property and claimed that ghosts had stolen and converted this property, converted the uh, chattels, if you will. We also had consumer fraud claims, because on his website, Mr. Yost said that he used, uh, I can't even remember the term because it's so disgusting, but it was like uh, affection, affection trained. Like everything's like you give them a biscuit and they do what you want. Um, so misrepresentation because people were fooled by that fact. Um, and finally, we tried for a private right of action under the criminal code, uh, the anti cruelty code. The case went to within a week of trial and Yost settled. The settlement was just about a total win. And I say just about because a month or so before we got the three chimps, one of them died in his care. But Yost agreed to turn over these three chimpanzees, two of whom live in, say, the chimps in uh, Florida, and the other one was at the Center for Great, for great Apes in Florida, two great sanctuaries. And he agreed never to work with uh, chimpanzees again. So uh, it was a, a complete victory. Weren't sure about what was going to happen at trial, especially since we had a judge who I always like to sort of tell people this quote so you know what you're up against with the judiciary. In, in court, when we were trying to get the settlement uh, knocked out, Yost agreed to have Roger Fouts be a guardian ad litem for the chimpanzees, and we, of course, agreed as well. We went to the court to submit a stipulation that said Roger Fouts would watch out for the chimpanzees after they went to the sanctuaries. Yost claimed he cared about them, he didn't trust us to watch them, he wanted Roger to, uh, to watch them, and we were fine with Roger watching them as well. The judge said, I'm not entering this order. That would be like entering an order for a guardian ad litem for a box of rocks. That's a quote. So our judge was equating chimpanzees with a box of rocks. So we weren't feeling too good about trial, but nevertheless, I think Mr. Yost was so concerned about those allegations becoming public, because he still is a trainer today, just not a chimpanzee, that he did agree to settle. Um, 
So I just want to talk a little bit about what do you do, how do you prove these cases? Because that's the kind of thing, even when you get to trial, it's not that easy to convince the world that animals suffer, as you probably know. Even though maybe <coughs> many of us know it, you can't just anthropomorphize, you can't say, well, the dog is screaming or something. How do you prove it? And so you need objective evidence, not emotional evidence. How do you prove that chimpanzee has been hurt as badly as she has been hurt? So you, again, uh, just sort of an example of the kinds of things we put on. Not just somebody saying the chimpanzee was beaten, beaten, but putting on objective evidence. Most important being expert veterinarians, or, vet, or folks like Jane Goodall, who helped on these cases, or Roger Fowles, who can testify about the behaviors, the way the behaviors change. And that's even more important when you're talking about proving psychological harm. To, to me, the psychological harm for these animals is probably worse than the physical harm. Taya's injury is now completely healed. She no longer has a scar. And who knows what's going on in Taya's mind for the rest of her life, just like we know happens to abuse children and, and abused adults as well. So, and there's a real social resistance to this notion that chimpanzees or any other animals could have some kind of psychological internal conscience that is affected. But to me, again, because it's a permanent injury, as opposed to a, a physical injury that goes away by the time you get to trial, it's very important. And so more and more it's important to use uh, veterinarians who are willing to testify about pain and suffering in animals, and especially about psychological pain and suffering in animals. So that's the real frontier. Real quickly, the other big problem, a ethical, social problem, with using chimpanzees and other exotics in entertainment is, as I, I don't, know, I don't think I mentioned it, but by the ages of three to five, chimpanzees can't be used in entertainment anymore. They become chimpanzees. They'll hit you, they'll beat you, they'll um, bite you, as you know. They may even eat your hands and your face. But they go out to private owners. They go out to roadside zoos. They go out to biomedical research. So not only does the industry abuse them while they're there, but then abandons them to places that are arguably even worse. And fortunately, a small percentage of chimpanzees do get the sanctuaries. Um, and I, I wanted to put a pitch in for that because that's another area I've been able to use my uh, legal career and my legal skills helping sanctuaries. Again, there's, there's only nine chimpanzee sanctuaries in America, but there's hundreds of, of sanctuaries all around. And uh, being able to help them and get them to a place where they are happy forever. This is Negra. Now, she was a biomedical research chin, but never for the first 39 years of her life did she ever have a blanket or any food besides a piece of monkey chow. And today she's very happy in, in Clay Island, Washington, almost always has a blanket over her head, makes a little nest every night. But what's important to remember is that even for those chimps who get so lucky in Florida and Washington, they're always going to be on the other side of that wire. It's always going to be unnatural. Their confinement is going to be permanent. Again, a fact that you may not all know, you can't be turned into the wild. Even if they're wild caught chimps, it won't happen. There have been many attempts made so far, none really successful. So forever, they'll be on the other side of that fence. This is the um, Sweetwater Sanctuary in Kenya, where there's, the chimpanzees have a fantastic life. Uh, but that's a fence that will keep them forever from where they belong. So I guess the question I'd like to leave you with is, why do we need to make them uh, do unnatural acts? Isn't this entertaining? I think it is. Um, we can just watch what they're doing, watch the families, and we should be completely entertained on a regular basis. They, they get together, they do things, and our interests are certainly stimulated by watching that kind of thing. They act for us just by being who they are. Um, they get into odd partnerships. You don't have to have one of those weird TV shows where they have two different weird animals. Or you don't have to see those pictures on the internet that are actually from animal abusers who put uh, white, 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 white tigers with chimpanzees or dogs. Um, this is natural. They show us the beauty of nature. They show us the ideas of family. So we'll keep doing all we can to keep them wild and to keep us working for that. Thanks. OK, we have a few minutes for questions from our audience. Are there any questions for our speakers? Yes. Uh, Grace, uh, talked about all of you. Uh, a lot of states have legislation dictate or try to dictate what happens to an animal if it uh, bites a person. So if a dog, for example, you know, 
one might specify the dog is seized by animal control, the owner has this much time to collect the dog or the fine, the dog, but a lot of times the dog or the animal can end up being euthanized before the owner can even uh, have a chance to recover it. My question is how, like, an issue like that, if you have an animal, whether it's a dog or a tiger or an elephant on set, especially for even a monkey that tends to bite people, how do you handle that issue of you know, the animal potentially biting an actor, especially if it's you know, a multi-million dollar actor? Well, first of all, if, if it's showing any signs of aggression, it's pulled. I mean, we don't get it around the actor. Um, most often, if the scene calls for an actor to interact with um, an, a wild and exotic animal, um, for however they're trained off set, because you're right, we don't know, um, it's usually the trainer that will double for the actor. Um, they will not put the actor at risk in that way. So, um, it, it, it is an issue, and it's something that, um, you know, we, animals are unpredictable. So it's, uh, it's, it's really interesting. There's, there's a dwindling number of exotic animals in entertainment. And, you know, American Humane is not taking a position because it's not illegal to use them. We'd rather be neutral so that we know when they're being used. We can observe who's using them, who's bringing them, what they look like, etc. Um, but in the end, if uh, there's you know successful legislation and laws that prohibit their use, then we will no longer see them on set. Uh, but while they are, we're gonna we're gonna be there and try to step in. Uh, it's very very difficult. The, uh, just one addition to yours: um, the, the, the entertainment animals they're on set a very small part of the time, and they're used. At, as much as possible by the, their owners. So private parties, pool parties, Johnny's 8th birthday, that kind of thing. The chimpanzees often go. And we had testimony from many people that there, not on set, chimpanzees would bite, and then Yost would say to them, they're gonna kill him if you report it. And there are so many unreported bites by exotic animals because of that threat. Uh, you don't wanna see him die, do you? They'll cut off his head to check for rabies, that kind of thing. So there's a lot of unreported bites offset. Um, and just one other thing, the dangerous dog regulations usually cover dangerous dogs. Like both your chimpanzee and your cat could bite me, and it wouldn't be covered by most laws, although there might be other laws for these dogs. Gary? Um, I'm curious, what does American Humane get its authority and where does it get its funding? Um, some of our funding comes from uh, a neutral fund. It's an industry advancement and cooperative fund that is a branch of health and pension for both the Screen Actors Guild and uh, the, the uh, American Federation of Television Radio Artists. We also get funding from donations, and uh, our jurisdiction is because we are in the Screen Actors Guild codified agreement. So, so, the, so the, basically the industry gives you the authority and the industry provides financing? To some, some to, to some extent, but it's, okay. it's so, it's so non-specific mm -hmm. that, um, you know, we can still rate something unacceptable and they still have to let us on their next show. I understand, but, but okay, well, I'll, I'll address that. Yes. I wanted to ask more about you in the case of Yost, because you were the Sure. It's a little complicated, but so there's something called a um, split listing for chimpanzees. Is uh, this the, like, if they're captive-born or hybrid animals, some of them aren't covered the same? Yeah, virtually none of them are covered. So there's no protection for them other than the anti-cruelty laws. So our argument was that uh, while the exemption was intended to allow them to use the research and even in, in entertainment, Congress didn't intend to go so far to sanction the beating of chimpanzees with locks and sticks and bats, and so that that should be an exception to the exception. To the exception. Uh, this question is for Mr. Wagman. I'm curious when you said the chimps can't go back into the wild, what has happened when they've tried to do that? Do they lose their skills because of the psychological abuse or what is that? A combination of things. I mean, there's two kinds of types of chimps and reentry programs that have been attempted. One is chimps who are uh, captive born, that's never worked. And others are chimps who are wild born, and there are still a couple programs going on in Africa, but for the most part, they starve or are killed by 
other chimpanzees because they're just not members of the troop. They don't have the skills. They're strangers, uh, and they don't know how to forage. It's, it's not an easy life out there in the jungle. Amanda shows her here, and so I'm interested about the ratings of unacceptable. Do the actual reports go? go beyond your organization and do you guys press legal charges? Are you guys responsible for that when you're rating or is it just rated unacceptable and then these reports of animal abuse or unsatisfactory animal abuse, do they go anywhere? Uh, actually, no. They, they could. They could. We could press charges if we felt that it rose to a level of legal cruelty. Um, most of the time, we'll rate it unacceptable because we step in and sort of mitigate it midstream. That doesn't mean that they're already doing something that we find unacceptable.